The Middle East conflict has escalated significantly, with Iran launching more than 180 drones and dozens of ballistic missiles at Israel. Israeli defence officials said most of the weapons were intercepted by Israel's famous Iron Dome defence system, but confirmed one military base was slightly damaged and at least one child was injured. It's believed the attack was a response to a strike by Israel that killed Iranian military leaders on April 1. Iran has vowed to take revenge after an Israeli airstrike killed several people at its embassy compound in Syria. Two generals and five advisers were killed in what's been described as the most significant attack yet on Iranian interests. I spoke with the Australian's foreign editor, Greg Sheridan, on Sunday afternoon in the hours following the strike. We're bringing you that conversation in today's episode. You can follow rolling updates of this developing situation at theaustralian.com.au. Greg, this is a very fast-moving story, but the latest update is that sources in Israel's war cabinet are telling Israeli media that Israelis shouldn't go to bed because a response from Israel is coming. Can you set the scene for us, please, about this attack by Iran? What was motivating it and what happened? Well, Claire, you're right. The situation is very fluid. What motivated Iran? It's very hard to answer that properly. Everybody will tell you, but, uh, you know, I think our authoritative sources as out of the Iranian leadership are pretty limited. The Iranians have been willing to fight right up to the last Arab against Israel. By that, I mean they like to use their proxies, the Hezbollah group in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, They have clients in the Palestinian extremist groups, Shia militias in Syria and Iraq, and of course the Houthis in Yemen. And they don't mind if those groups suffer retaliation from the Israelis because of their attacks on Israel. (laughs) Up until now, one reason this is a really big historic turning point is that Iran has not taken conventional military action itself against Israel. Uh, Now, why did they do it? Maybe they did it because Israel killed a couple of their generals in Syria recently. Maybe they did it to demonstrate to their Hamas and Hezbollah allies that they were going to put some skin in the game as well. This could be a prelude to a major Hezbollah attack on northern Israel. Maybe they did it to show a, a degree of contempt for Israel and for the United States. They've said that their action is over now and they would hope that that means the United States and Israel limit their retaliation. But if they do do some retaliation, that may give the Iranian regime the excuse it wants to convert the nuclear energy program into a nuclear weapons program. They might have been motivated by genuine theological hatred of Israel. You can't underestimate that as a factor in these matters. But to be honest with you, Claire, nobody in the world except the Iranians knows exactly why the Iranians did what they did. Greg, we've had reports of an imminent attack from Iran for a couple of weeks now coming out of Israel, and Israelis were preparing for something very serious. There were also reports that Israel's famous Iron Dome, that's the missile defence system, might not be able to cope with very heavy artillery coming in from Iran. In fact, what seems to have happened is that the Iron Dome has taken care of these drones uh, and other missiles that have been fired at Israel. Does that mean Iran pulled its punches and didn't launch an attack as, as potentially catastrophic as it could have? Yeah, it certainly does mean that. But Iran may be doing what its forces have done in the Middle East for quite a while now, which is to do something which is utterly outrageous, unforgivable, unjustifiable and wrong, but then say, look, we didn't kill many people, therefore you shouldn't retaliate. And that's an equation that terrorists play with the West a lot. But it's very important, Claire, to realise that we're just the beginning of something here. It's a bit difficult to have post-mortem analysis yet. The reports about imminent Iranian attacks came mainly from American intelligence. And when the Americans release intelligence publicly, it's turning out to be extremely accurate. Now, the Americans released that intelligence in order to make sure everyone's prepared, but also to try to dissuade their enemies from taking the action. Now, it is certainly the case that if the Iranians had 
put up a bigger barrage and at the same time triggered missile firings from Lebanon, there is always the danger that the Iron Dome system can be overwhelmed. I mean, Hezbollah has many, many more than 100,000 missiles, and the Iranians certainly have many more than that. If everything's fired at once against Israel, no air defence system can cope, and then there would be widespread Israeli casualties. But of course, if you have that, then you're going to get massive Israeli retaliation, and it's very likely you'll get American retaliation too. I mean, Biden said to Iran, don't attack Israel. Do not do it. And Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, has often said, superpowers don't bluff. Iran's Revolutionary Guard issued a warning to the United States, saying in a statement published in the Tehran Times, any support and participation in striking Iran's interests would result in a crushing response. Now, I think Israel will have to respond. I think America may very well have to respond. But then the arguments about what kind of response you get are interesting. Do you just want a symbolic response to show you can't hit us with impunity? I mean, part of this problem arises from the fact that Biden has had a very poor policy towards Iran. He's had a policy of trying to woo Iran into cooperation, the same as Barack Obama had. Back in 2015, Barack Obama struck a deal with Iran. The idea was to stop Iran developing a nuclear weapon, and Iran agreed to dramatically slow down its development of nuclear technology in return for the US agreeing to lift sanctions that were crippling its economy. Donald Trump ripped up that deal in 2018, saying Iran could not be trusted. And now, President Joe Biden is trying to restore the relationship again. Biden wanted Iran to release American prisoners it was holding and, in return, arranged for billions of dollars in Iranian assets to be unfrozen. That is, to allow Iran to access money held in offshore accounts in order to prop up its economy. And that's been an absolute failure. I mean, I test Donald Trump in many ways, but his Iran policy was much more effective trying to contain Iran, keeping its revenue down and so forth. And the $64 million question would be, if you're going to hit Iran, America and Israel, maybe now is the time to hit their nuclear facilities because they are within a hair's breadth of developing enriched uranium to the point that they could produce a weapon. Now, as far as we know, from all the intelligence reports, they have not produced a weapon yet. So they're going to stand at the threshold of a weapon. But the calculations that the Iranians must make and that the Israelis and the Americans must make about, so what does this mean for Iran's nuclear weapons program? Where would we be in dealing with Iranian aggression throughout the region if Iran had nuclear weapons? So maybe Israel just does a small symbolic retaliation. Does Iran then say, okay, fair enough, everything's over for the moment? Or does Israel try to achieve some strategic objective through a retaliation? Does America get involved? As we are talking, Claire, American security officials are meeting at the at the highest possible level to work out what they do and how they coordinate what they do with Israel. I can't believe Iran thinks this is just one off. That would be a tremendous victory for it if it got to strike Israel without any consequence. So as I was saying earlier, one of the big problems is that it's been striking Israel and American targets, American military targets, all through the Middle East and America's allies, and not suffering any consequence because it mounts its strikes through proxies, through Hezbollah and the Houthis and the militias in Syria and so forth. It doesn't get attacked except when Israel or America attacks its personnel in Syria. So I don't now think that it can launch a conventional attack on Israel itself and not expect there to be some consequences. Coming up after the break, more of my conversation with Greg Sheridan. Don't forget, subscribers to The Australian get these kinds of live updates and analysis 24-7. Check us out at theaustralian.com.au and we'll be back after this break. Thousands of Iranians showed support for their government's unprecedented airstrike on Israel on Sunday, taking to the streets and chanting death to Israel and death to America. 
but elsewhere in the Middle East, the sentiment is different. Greg, both the United States and the United Kingdom were involved in helping Israel defend itself against this attack. But, Greg, also the Jordanian Air Force has reportedly been involved in helping Israel shoot down some of these drones. And Saudi Arabia has issued a statement calling for calm and saying it doesn't want there to be a war. Can we talk about what's going on in the region? How do we interpret those moves by Jordan and Saudi Arabia? All the Arab Gulf nations, with about one exception, are hostile to Iran and terrified of Iran. There's a fundamental split in the Middle East between the Sunni axis and the Shia axis, and Iran now has its so-called ring of fire around Israel through the Houthi rebels, the Shia militia in Syria and Iraq, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza and Palestinian terrorist groups it funds in the West Bank. But that is not only a ring of fire against Israel, it's also a tremendous danger to the Gulf Arab nations. And we saw a couple of years ago the Houthis mount a shocking missile attack on Saudi Arabian oil facilities, the Aramco facility. Smoke rises over the Jeddah skyline, the apparent target, the massive oil complex on the outskirts of the city, the Houthi rebels based in Yemen claiming responsibility. And the Saudis did indeed strike against the Houthis, but nobody struck against Iran. So Iran could impose all these penalties on all these regional nations, more or less with impunity. And there is a fundamental conflict between the Gulf Sunni Arab states and Iran's Shiite empire, although Iran does seek to lead the whole of Islam. Also, Iran preaches death to America and death to Israel. The Gulf Arab states, they may not be liberal democracies exactly, but they don't want to live according to those um, dynamics. So it was partly to stop the growing alliance between the Gulf Arab states and Israel that Hamas launched its offensive on October 7. Now, it had a lot of other objectives as well, but it was particularly distressed at the idea that Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to establish diplomatic relations. Now, Again, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, but the one area of his foreign policy that was tremendously successful was the so-called Abraham Accords between Israel and four of its Islamic neighbours. And you can see there, there's a natural formation of a Gulf Sunni Israel-United States alliance, which among other things would contain the influence of Iran. Now, Iran is determined that that alliance will be smashed up. And it it did that primarily by the Hamas attack on Israel, which will inflame popular Muslim opinion against Israel and against the West. But the things that you just cited, the Jordanians helping the Israelis and so on, are evidence of this underlying deep reality in the Middle East of the split between the Shia Iranians and the Sunni Gulf states. This situation is moving fast, so fast even analysts like Greg who's been reporting and writing on the Middle East for decades, find it hard to unpick motive and consequence. You know, I mean, that question, why did Iran do this? That's a very, very good question. And honestly, anyone who tells you they know the answer for the moment is bluffing because uh, it just didn't seem to be their strategy right up until now. So who knows? Greg Sheridan is The Australian's foreign editor. We'll be back on Monday with all the rest of the news, going deep into a shocking massacre at Sydney's Bondi Junction and getting ready for Monday's huge news, a final decision in the Bruce Lehrman defamation trial. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Subscribe at theaustralian.com.au. 